Hello there, my fellow belligerent knights, and welcome back to some Warhammer Fantasy lore. Today we shall once again expand our mini-series on the Bretonian dukedoms with another one of these mini-realms. Namely, the land of Carcassonne, which has the honor, if you may call it that, of having the longest name out of all the Bretonian dukedoms. Not really relevant, but I thought it was a bit of fun trivia. The people of this land have the reputation of being the most martial out of all the people in Bretonia. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us find out why, shall we? A highly warlike dukedom, even in comparison to the other Bretonian provinces which are well known for their valor, Carcassonne is a heavily militarized land. Most of their efforts are directed at the eradication of the greenskin tribes infesting the Irana Mountains, all the way at the southern border. Carcassonne itself lies in the southern borders of Bretonia, covering much of the Irana Mountains and bordering Estalia in the west, Tylea to the south, and Athaloran to the east. The land is split into four regions by the three great tributaries of the river Brienne, and Brienne itself forms the northern border. There are narrow bands of arable land along portions of the major rivers, but the overwhelming majority of Carcassonne is pastoral or mountain. The shepherdesses of Carcassonne are particularly famous in the rest of Bretonia for their strength, courage, and a complete lack of feminine charm. The eastern portions of the duchy were once the land of Glanboriel, but that dukedom was utterly destroyed by the invasion of the orcs which led to the unification of Bretonia. The area is now distinguished by the hill forts, which were the strongholds of the Glanborian nobility once upon a time, nowadays abandoned. Popular legend says that they are all haunted too, and at least in some cases, the legends are known to be justified. The main enemy facing Carcassonne, though, is the constant raiding of the greenskins of the Irana Mountains and of the Vaults. To the east of the dukedom, they sometimes get aid from the Fae of Athel Loran. But the Carcassonians have never had as good relations with the Fae as their neighbors in the north in Quenel. For the most part, they stand by themselves, trusting to their military prowess, and for the most part, that trust is justified. In more recent years, Carcassonian knights have begun talking of the Iron Orcs of the mountains, servants of chaos reinforcing the normal Orc hordes and who are bigger and stronger even than the infamous Black Orcs. So far, only the natives of Carcassonne claim to have seen them. Even Tylians, with territory in the very same mountains, have seen nothing. Or if they have, they are saying nothing. Many people think they are just a story to back up the Carcassonian demands for reduced taxes. The most recent leader of Carcassonne is one Duke Hubald. Hubald is a relatively small man compared to other Bretonian knights, but is wiry and fast rather than powerful. He speaks only when absolutely necessary, and even then, he uses as few words as possible. No one who knows him has ever seen him smile, much less heard him laugh. His wife, Schmerilde, was a political match, and the fact that the couple have four children, all of whom take after the duke, is a matter of some wonderment. The duke is, however, respected by all his knights and men-at-arms. He is the finest war leader that the Carcassonians have had in many generations, and a brave warrior in person. Unlike other Bretonian knights, he is willing to use ambushes and feints to defeat monstrous opponents. He argues that the orcs pouring out of the Irana Mountains to the south to burn villages and take prisoners do not deserve to be fought with honor or chivalry. The heraldry of Carcassonne is a simple sword upon a shield. This was adopted originally by Duke Lombard, one of the companions of Gilles Le Breton, as a symbol of respect for the culture of his parents. For centuries, and right out of birth, the noble sons of Carcassonne have thus been given to touch a sword forged especially for them, which is hung above their cradle until they are able to wield it. The folk of Carcassonne are a martial people, believing that prowess at arms is their birthright and their duty. This mentality is reinforced by the constant greenskin raiding, which often reaches quite a way into the dukedom before a strong enough force can be assembled to destroy them. Almost all Carcassonians have some military training, even the peasants. 
However, they do not look down upon those who are not warriors. This is best seen in their attitude towards Brio, a dukedom that spends all its time on poetry. The Carcassonians like to listen to Brionian minstrels when they have the time, and those who can visit Castle Brio to see the wonders of that city. They are proud of these achievements because, they say, they are the ones fighting to make these things possible. They fight so that Brionians do not have to, and they are very proud of this. Many Carcassonian adventurers travel to employ their martial skills against enemies in other parts of the old world. Others travel because their talents are not martial, and they find it very difficult to receive the recognition they think they deserve within Carcassonne. The minstrels of Briand are all very well received here, but a true son of Carcassonne should be a warrior. Two Carcassonian customs have achieved a degree of fame beyond the dukedom too. The first is the birth sword. All male nobles are presented with a fine blade at their birth. This is supposed to be the first thing that they grasp. The sword is then hung above the boy's bed until he is old enough to train with it, and from that point onwards it rests on a rack beside his bed while he is sleeping. Many Carcassonians refuse to fight with any other weapon, and indeed they seem to do better in battle while holding it. The second custom is the so-called Carcassonian Shepherds. Peasants cannot, of course, be trusted to fight on their own, and it would greatly shame Bretonians to hire mercenaries. However, the flocks of sheep in the foothills do need protection, and there is no shame in hiring shepherds who can defend themselves. On one hand, Carcassonian shepherds and shepherdesses are trained warriors, and they are also trained to operate alone, spying on harassing orc warbands. On the other hand, Carcassonian nobles sometimes hire foreign shepherds, often in bands with a skilled leader, and give them just a single symbolic sheep to look after. The pay is supposed to be 50 pennies a day, but the nobility are remarkably careless about dropping whole purses of gold in front of the shepherd. The mercenaries hired in this manner find it very amusing. Many even manage to resist the temptation to eat the sheep for at least one week while some adopted as a mascot. Castle Carcassonne is a fortress city and the ducal capital of the region. It stands on an island surrounded by the river Zang, the westernmost of the tributaries of the river Brienne which lies wholly within this dukedom. The attached town is quite small and exists to provide services to the large number of shepherd companies who come to the city to take jobs with the duke. As a result, it is quite a rough place indeed. The castle itself is designed to be defensible, but acts mainly as a base camp. The duke would rather not fall here to prepare for a siege. Rather, he would harry invading armies while slowly falling back to Brienne. There is only a single curtain wall here, which encloses a large mustering area and the keep is also quite small. The duke lives in a complex of buildings that are less defensible, but much more comfortable. Another interesting character associated with this duchy is one jean dois de Touran. This guy rules over the Grand Duchy of Savoy, situated in the Volts mountain range, along the river Po, one of the other tributaries of the river Brienne. It is a small land, a minor fiefdom of the Marquis of Carcassonne, with a culture that shows a strong Tylean influence. Savoy is famous for the unbending devotion of its people and rulers to the Lady of the Lake though. Its capital town, Turan, is visited all throughout the year by pilgrims, who seek visions of the lady in the famous chapel containing the shroud of Gilles Le Breton himself. The holy relic still bears the image of the hero's body, imprinted by his blood the day he was mortally wounded. In times of war, Baron Jandois can deploy a force that is quite small, but made up of highly inspired and determined warriors, known collectively as Les Savoyards and they are incredibly strong in their unquenchable faith in the lady. jean himself is a grail knight, leading his companion knights on the battlefield under the protection of a magical banner bearing the symbol of the bull. He adopted this after slaying, as part of the grail quest, the Minotaur Lord who was leading a rampaging warband of beastmen throughout the dukedom of Carcassonne. jean is notable not just for his status, but also for his marriage. The Baron's Banner of Shielding is carried into battle by none other than Giacometta, his wife. 
She was the only child of the former Grand Duke, and was an aspiring priestess until directed by a vision from the lady onto the quest of a real knight. As such, Jean Dois' wife is the only woman known to have supped out of the Holy Grail. Their first son was left to roam the land of the Old World in his own quest for the Grail. They also have two twin daughters, Julia and Margherita, powerful Grail damsels in their own right, who even studied magic in Aldorf. The twins will use their powers to protect the Baron's land and army from evil magic. In battle, the Baron rides at the head of five other Grail Knights known as the Wardens of the Shroud. Another powerful Grail Knight, Pierre de la Mica, is the keeper of Turan's Grail Chapel and the first defender of the Holy Shroud. Serving as the Baron's greatest champion, he rides into battle aboard a noble Pegasus called Bonarius. Finally, another faithful knight is Camille Benso, Count of the village of Cavo, who leads a regiment of his own peer knights, minor lords on the fief of Savoy. They are followed into battle by their own sons, who live as knights errant and wear the traditional white livery representing their humble status. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the lands of Carcassonne, and Savoy too, it seems, for today. For a land predominantly focused on killing orcs, I actually enjoyed learning about them quite a bit. Especially the Savoy bits, and I was actually surprised to find that this dukedom are the host of the Shroud of Saint Gilles. As usual, you can rely on good old GW to rip off real historical places as Carcassonne is a real thing. In fact, if you're watching this and not just listening, I did add a couple of pictures from the actual castle of Carcassonne. As always though, I look forward to your thoughts on these Bretonians in the comments below. Thanks a lot for watching, and may the blessings of the lady be upon you.